right. Welcome to NOAA Science Camp's virtual programming. My name is Lisa Hiruki Raring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. These webinars are a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, Washington Sea Grant, and NOAA Fisheries Northwest Fisheries Science Center. NOAA Science Camp is a hands-on summer science program that in other years is held in person at our NOAA Western Regional Center here in Seattle and is designed to show you how NOAA science touches your everyday life and how NOAA offices work together to ad address environmental issues. Since, since, since this summer we're online, we wanted to put, put together a series of webinars and activities to give you a look at NOAA's work on particular topics and how our scientists conduct research. The webinars this week are designed to help you get to know about NOAA's work on marine mammals and the technology we use to study them and why we want to know the information that, they, that we're researching. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at different career paths that you might be interested in. Today, we are introducing you to Don Noren and Marla Holt, who work for NOAA Fisheries Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, Washington. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have sub substantial Indigenous knowledge and much to share with us. Don and Marla work in Puget Sound waters, or more generally in the Salish Sea, which include the Strait of Georgia, the Strait of Juan de Pu Pu Puget Sound, and the network of channels and waterways that connect them. These are the traditional homelands and waters of the Coast Salish tribes and First Nations who have st stewarded these lands and waters for thousands of years. We'd like to acknowledge that Don and Marla are presenting from, and we are hosting the webinar from, the traditional lands of the First People of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure that everyone can hear our speakers. However, there's a box where you can write questions and we encourage you to ask them as we go. I'll be keeping track of the questions for our speakers behind the scenes and they'll stop every now and again and answer a few. We may not get to all of the questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'll hand it over to Don and Marla to introduce themselves. Hello. Um, I'm Dawn Noren and I'm a research fishery biologist. I grew up in Maryland on the east coast of the United States. Um, I grew up in Germantown, so it's a suburb of Washington, D.C. So I was three hours from the coast, about an hour from the Chesapeake Bay, but I always had an infatuation with the ocean and especially dolphins. There's an aquarium in Baltimore about an hour from my house. I used to love to go there and see the dolphins. Eventually, when I was in um, undergraduate at University of Maryland, I had an internship there to work with the mammals, including the dolphins and the seals. After undergrad, I decided I really wanted to study these creatures for my career. So I moved all the way across the country to California and landed in UC Santa Cruz to study marine mammals. And I got to conduct my own research on dolphins and elephant seals. Then I moved up to Seattle and my first job was at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center where I worked on stellar sea lions. And then a year later, I landed the job that I have now working on killer whales. And I'm actually a physiologist who studies how the inner body of these animals work and how we can relate their, uh, their bodies to the environment. So I'm gonna give you an introduction first of how these animals, um, those Southern resident killer whales that we study and, and just an introduction in general about killer whales. They're actually the largest dolphin. Uh, all across the world, these animals can be found, but they travel in distinct groups based on their appearance, their di diet, their behavior, and their social sounds. They really don't mix with the others. They're pretty um, tight-knit groups. Adult males are much larger than the adult females. So if you see a dorsal fin that's about six feet tall, you're looking at a killer whale that's a male. Females and males live for a pretty long time. On average, females live for 50 years and males live to about 30, but they can live a longer than that for some individuals. We're gonna be talking about the Southern resident killer whales that are along the Eastern coast of the North Pacific Ocean. Um, but I wanted to show you that there's other resident killer whales. These are what we call fish eaters. In fact, in that coastal Pacific Ocean along Canada, Alaska, and the rest of the US, we have five distinct groups of fish eating killer whales. The southern resident killer whales, their distribution is shown in that hot pink that I've circled. So you can see that there is some overlap, but they're pretty distinct little groups that travel and, and work on their own. 
The southern resident killer whales have been studied since the early 70s thanks to the Center for Whale Research. They photographed and identified every individual since that time. We have three matrilineal pods, J, K, and L. Matrilineal pods mean that the animals that travel together are very closely related. In fact, boys and girls stay with their mom and their close relatives for their entire life. K pod is our smallest pod with 17 individuals. And we can tell each individual apart by the dorsal fin shape and those nicks that are shown in those pictures there pointing to those arrows in the dorsal fin. And also that saddle patch that's behind the dorsal fin, the varying shades of white, the color and the shape and the scars are very distinct across individuals. So if you look at a group of whales in the wild, you can see who's who just by studying those pictures. Because they've been studied since the 70s and because they stay with their moms, we actually have an estimated birth date for every individual and we know who the mothers are too. All of this information really helps us understand how this group lives and works together. And we can recognize individuals in the water, from the air, from the land, and from boats to study these whales. So um, the southern resident killer whales, as I mentioned, are the group that we studied. Unfortunately, they're endangered because of their small size. And I'm gonna go over some risk factors that they're facing, things that um, we need to study. We first need to determine what prey they eat. They're fish eaters, but what kind? So lots of different studies have been conducted to look at what, what fish they're eating. When a whale is dead and washes up on the beach, you can see its stomach contents. These animals actually eat salmon, so they're somewhat large. You can see in that middle picture a fish with a, a salmon in its mouth. And then colleagues that we work with at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center will follow behind these whales with a pool net. They're sloppy eaters, they share food, so they, they're they leave chunks behind in the water. So you can pick up scales, you can pick up um, tissue chunks and meat chunks, and then they also pick up the poop. And with all this information, you can give these samples to the geneticists and determine what they're eating. They primarily eat salmon, particularly Chinook. Unfortunately, many Chinook are declining in number as well or are smaller or less fatty these days. Another risk factor is that they have um, disturbance from vessels during the summer they're in the San Juan area in the inland waters of Washington and Canada, and they have a large whale watch fleet as well as just recreational boaters that like to see them. Many studies have been conducted from land and from boats have shown that they change their breathing and swimming patterns. They increase their surface active behaviors. I'll show you some pictures of those later. And they increase their social calls, the loudness of their calls, and Marla will uh, demonstrate some of those later as well. Also, they change their behavior from hunting for food to increasing their travel. Another risk factor that they have is this high chemical pollutant levels. Um, the chemists at our center study persistent organic pollutants or POPs. Some of these are PCBs, which are found in electrical equipment, DDTs, which are found in insecticides, and PBDEs, which are used for, as fire retardants. Many of these compounds have been banned for quite some time. However, they're persistent. They persist in the environment. They don't break down very easily. They also associate with fat. So the young calves receive these pops from their mother's milk and from the prey they eat. Because these whales have a large blubber layer that keeps them warm, they accumulate high levels of these contaminants in their blubber over their lifetime. Unfortunately, these pops cause many health issues and can make animals sick. So we're, we want to know how many contaminants each individual has. So what we have done in the past is we've biopsy darted them remotely. That little dart uh, is sticking into the animal right there shown by the arrow um, on the left. We pull just a tiny piece of blubber and skin to analyze that blubber to see what the contaminant levels are. Another question that we had to answer when we first started studying these whales is where do these southern resident killer whales go in the winter? It's easy to see them in the summer when they're in the waters and the weather is nice, but why is it so hard to find them in the winter time? Well, the Pacific Northwest is known for quite ferocious storms. You can see that satellite image now, that red is not a pretty storm. We have gone out on ships to try to find them too, but we get stuck in those storms. And you can see the, the picture of us um, out the window on the back deck of the ship, NOAA ship. It's pretty rocky. When we were lucky and had nice weather or we were actually somewhere near the whales, we could find them. But we've spent 21 days out there and not seen them or seen them on the last day. So another trick, I'm going to start this animation right now while I talk about these tags. You're going to see tagged tracks from two male killer whales tagged a couple years apart, traveling up and down the coast. So we'll start with K25. He was tagged in December 2012. He's the green dot. 
by remotely launching these tags with barbs on them into the dorsal fin, kind of like a, um, an earring gun, um, you can have the whale travel with a tag that talks to a satellite. Doesn't require people and you get continuous data. So you can see it's just rolling up and down the coast of California and Washington. And here comes L84, who is tagged a couple years later. Um, these tags eventually do work themselves out of the dorsal fin, but it's interesting to note, you can see the overlap of dots. These animals weren't tagged in the same year, but they're using similar spaces even though they're separated by a couple of years. So you can see that there's quite a few locations along the coast that are really important for them, especially that area by Columbia River between Oregon and Washington and up in Northern Washington. And it's interesting to see that this is an area that they like several years in a row. So we're gonna let that play out. And that is the last slide I have. So we can go for any questions. Okay, thanks, Don. That was very interesting. Um, so um, we had a question um, on one of your slides. You said it said uh, Southern Resident Killer Whale, and then the initials DPS. And I was wondering whether you could tell us what DPS stands for. Thank you. Sorry about that. It is distinct population segment. So in general, killer whales worldwide are just recognized as one species. But we know by looking at them and also the genetics that there are differences across the different groups. So southern resident killer whales are deemed a distinct population segment that is listed as endangered. Not all killer whales are endangered. Got it. Okay. Um, and then another question from those slides was, what does matrilineal mean? I think that you had talked a little bit about this, but we did have a question about what, what does matrilineal mean? Right. So um, killer whales, somewhat like elephants, are um, their social system is based on the mom. So matrilineal is just related to the mom. So as I mentioned, um, the boys and the girls will stay with their mom for their entire lives. Clearly the mom will usually die earlier, but regardless, they'll stay in that same family group of close relatives that are all tied to the females. So that's what a matrilineal group is. Got it. Um, so we all, Theodore had a question about the tags that you were talking about, the satellite tags. Um, and he was wondering, did these tags ever come off? Yes, so I probably said it really quickly, but those barbs, they do work themselves out. So the tags will last from a, uh, like a week or so to even months. The tracks I showed you were over a couple months, but um, the, the dorsal fin is, is collagen, just kind of like your, um, and, and like tissue that's similar to your nose. So eventually, because the barbs are made to come out, they lose those tags and those holes heal over time. So it's kind of like getting an earring and then having the earring fall out. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. Um, we also had a question from Weston who was wondering, um, you, had, you had mentioned that the resident orcas um, eat salmon and um, Weston was wondering, why did the resident orcas stop eating other animals? Well, they eat other fish as well, um, but the salmon is their main diet um, and they really like that Chinook because they're huge and fat. Um, it's interesting, you may know about other killer whales that eat mammals, so they're very distinct. As I mentioned, the groups are separated by diet. So it seems like, you know, they kind of just have this history of going to the places where they eat the food that has been eaten by their relatives in the past, and they have this history and this consistent diet that they still eat. So people have often asked, well, shoot, if, they're, if, they're content, if their salmon are in decline, why can't they just go eat a seal like those other killer whales that are coming through the same area, but they just don't. They kind of learn their um, diet preference from their mom and they stick with it. So would that be a cultural difference, sort of like how some cultures of people don't eat meat and others do? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way of describing it. Um, killer whales are, you know, people have described killer whale culture and I think that's part of it, as well as the social sounds that you'll hear later. They're very interesting groups that are more different than you may think. They look the same, black and white, um, but they're really different when you start looking at them. That's really interesting. Um, so Michelle from Hawaii was wondering, do they mate year round? That's a great question. So unlike other baleen whales that may eat somewhere and then go have their babies elsewhere, uh, killer whales can mate year round. I mean, we sometimes have more calves born at the end of the winter or early spring, but um, there's definitely been calves born pretty much around the year. There's no distinct mating season. Great. Well, 
Um, I know that you have a lot of other things that you're going to be talking with us about. And so I think that we'll hold on to the rest of our questions and move on to your next section, if that's okay. Great. So as I mentioned before, I'm a physiologist and actually a lot of the studies that I'm interested in and understanding what the impacts are of those risk factors, it's really hard to do on wild animals. So I'm gonna talk about some studies that we've done on trained dolphins and killer whales to understand how bad these risk factors are for these whales. So I mentioned the boat studies and what they found um, and others have found about what the killer whales do in response to boats. So I said they uh, do um, surface active behaviors, they increase those. Those are the pictures I promised I'd show you, the different types of surface active behaviors that killer whales do. They increase their social calls, they kind of talk, they produce their sounds louder. Like if you were in a restaurant, you had to yell with the people that, uh, you're sitting with because it got too loud. They also increase their swim speed. Now, all of these activities have the potential to make them burn more energy. Like if you're running around the block because you were trying to escape a boat, you might start sweating a little bit and burn more calories. But we don't know what the calories are that these animals are expending. And that's what one of the studies was aiming to determine. So I have a collaboration with uh, researchers at UC Santa Cruz who have trained dolphins that participate in research all the time. So the first study was how many calories are burned when these animals are doing their surface active behavior. So here on the top left is a dolphin breech. We measured bouts of those. We have bottlenose dolphin tail slaps. We have them do tail slaps as well. And so what these animals did was either a tail slap or breech behaviors in a row. Then they were swam uh, slowly to this dome that you see on the top left. And it's a dome that measures oxygen consumed, which equates to calories burned, kind of like a Fitbit. So that dome will take just a sample of the air that the animal's breathing out, and we know how much oxygen it's taking in, and can determine how many calories it took for that dolphin to perform those behaviors. So on the bottom right screen, you see the computer screen, and this is recovery period after the breaches. So it was really high energy, lots of um, oxygen used, and over time, just like after you rest after you're running, it, it recovers. So what did we find? Well, not surprisingly, the energetic cost of breaching is much greater. And the more breaches they perform, the many times they put that big body out of the water, it's gonna be a higher cost. Tail slapping is really cheap, not much different than resting or swimming slowly. Now, taking this, these results back into the field, we observe killer whales performing surface active behaviors in response to vessels, but not always. It's relatively rare. And what's interesting with killer whales is they most often perform those tail slaps. So what we know from this, with the low amount of time they're performing these surface active behaviors and the low cost of tail slaps, there's probably a pretty low total energetic cost or number of calories being burned to, per, to um, perform those surface active behaviors. Now we also have a study where we had the animal producing their sounds and increasing their sounds under the dome to measure that. You'll see a video now. Okay, so I am going to be loading up the video here and hold on just a sec. And we'll get started. Great. So the dolphin's gonna produce a social sound out of the dome and we're measuring how much it costs. Okay, so now, Don, I'm going to make you the presenter again. Okay. There you go. Thank you. So what did that study find? Well, um, on average, the cost of producing those sounds is about 1.2 to, to 1.5 times resting. What does that mean in human terms? Basically, it's you sitting on a couch watching TV or at maximum, you're working on a computer. That's pretty sedentary. So not much energy used. Um, we also did find a cost for those animals to make their calls louder, but again, not very expensive. So these studies show that the main impact of vessel disturbance is probably not that increased energy expenditure, but we do have to be worried about the lack of foraging that they're doing. The second study I wanna to talk to you about is how do moms pass those contaminants onto their calves? We take those blubber biopsies and they're just a snapshot. We're not gonna repeatedly biopsy animals in the field and we don't biopsy calves. So we wanted to find out how many pops are going from the mom's milk during nursing and also when she's pregnant, are there uh, contaminants going to the calf while she's pregnant? 
And is there a period of time when these calves are getting higher levels from their mothers? So we can use trained killer whales at SeaWorld that are already trained for um, vet purposes and husbandry purpose and checkup purposes to give blood and milk samples regularly. So we were able to get blood and milk sampled from several females during lactation and also during gestation and the blood from nursing calves. So you can see pictures here, but it's probably more exciting to see a video. So you'll be seeing a video now showing the blood, uh, showing a milk sample and a little bit more okay. about the study. All right, so here we go. And SeaWorld produced this, that, this I work on the wild killer whales in the Pacific Northwest, the endangered southern resident killer whales, which are a highly contaminated group of whales. And um, this contamination is a huge risk factor. Looking at the transfer of contaminants during the lactation process from the female to her calf, one of the key factors that we're missing is what is the offload from the mom to the calf during lactation. What percent of each of the contaminants that we look at are offloaded? And we can't get that through the wild whales. So we're looking at that here in the whales at SeaWorld so that we can actually quantify that percent offload and actually populate those models with better data. Our role in the study is really to procure samples um, for the study of looking at contaminant transfer from mom to calf. That involves a uh, blood sample, milk sample, and a blubber measurement with ultrasound. This is a great opportunity for us to collaborate with researchers that are focusing on wild populations. It gives us a sense of purpose uh, to help with these studies because we know we have an effect on our oceans and to what effect we are still learning. And that's the crazy thing is we have so much to learn from our animals. And by having animals in our care, we're able to actually help that effort and, and actually learn from our animals so that we can ha actually help wild populations. The presenter again. So what do we find? So we did find that MAMS moms, excuse me, do decrease their contaminant loads by passing on high contaminant loads to their calves. They pass on a little bit during the pregnancy, but the greatest transfer is through that milk while nursing. And unfortunately, even though these uh, calves can nurse for a year or more, the greatest transfer actually occurs during the first few months after birth, when these animals are even more susceptible to health impacts. First time moms are more contaminated, so they actually pass more contaminants onto their calves than females who had calves previously. So what we can determined from this study is firstborn calves in particular may have a higher risk of health impacts from pop exposure early on soon after birth. And so that is it for this section. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dawn. Um, so if you have any questions for Dawn about um, the studies that she's doing, please put your questions into the chat box. We did have a question about um, that last study that you were talking about with the, the mothers transferring um, toxins, the, those persistent organic pollutants into their calves. And so um, one of the questions was, did you look at the level of, of toxins in the mothers before they started um, to give milk to their, before their, their calf was born and then continue to do it afterwards? Was that how you were looking at, at um, contaminant levels? That's a great question and that's right. So what we did is we actually got blood samples while she was pregnant. So there's a little bit of transfer there too. So every month, the females had a blood sample taken while they're pregnant. <clears throat> and every two weeks for the first 15 months after birth, they got a blood and a milk sample when they were nursing. So we could see the change in rate of contaminant transfer and also the levels that she has. We don't biopsy killer whales at SeaWorld, but the blood is a great indicator of what the body levels are too. Oh, great. And so one of the questions was if, if the, if the, um, if the killer whale was at SeaWorld and was getting fish, you know, fed to them, how, how, how did they have contaminant levels? That's a great question. So I hate to break it to everybody, but we all have contaminant levels because it's in the environment. So we can't avoid it. Um, I did compare the contaminant levels from SeaWorld to the wild whales, not with blubber, but we can kind of estimate the same um, levels through blood. Uh, SeaWorld killer whales are given fish that are a little lower on the trophic level. They're not given a lot of salmon. They are different killer whales at SeaWorld that eat other fish too. Um, and the, the places they're getting their food are less contaminated than the southern resident killer whales. So the SeaWorld killer whales are actually less contaminated than the wild whales, but none of us can avoid contamination. In fact, humans pass on contaminants in their milk to their babies too. Oh, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Um, 
So Victoria from Bellevue was wondering, why would the killer whales increase their surface activities if there's more vessels near them? You were talking about their reaction to the, the vessels. Yeah, that's a great question. I wish I could be in a killer whale brain, but you know, they do other surface active behaviors when there's no vessels around. One of the times I saw one huge male doing about 20 breaches in a row, which was massive effort for a killer whale. Well, so there was no one else around but us and we were like really far away. So they do surface active behaviors for lots of reasons, but there does seem to be an increase in the rate when they're closely approached by vessels. And it could be a warning. You know, they often use, um, not only do they use their social sounds that they produce with their, um, their blowhole to make, uh, you know, to, for group cohesion. I've often seen them doing tail slaps to get groups back together or there's changing directions. So there's a lot of reasons why they're performing surface active behaviors, but possibly if they're being approached by a vessel, it might be a warning to other killer whales, there's a vessel or here I am, please don't run me over or whatever. You can only speculate, of course, but they do it for many different reasons and many different um, behaviors that they're performing, not just when there's vessels around. Right, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I did have a, we did have one more question before we move on to the next section. And there was a question about risk factors. Um, you had listed several risk factors for Southern resident killer whales, but you also showed that there were a lot of different um, populations of resident killer whales, um, not just in this, in the area around Puget Sound, but also up north, farther north along the uh, British Columbia and Alaska coast. And so um, are the risk fa factors that you, outline just for southern resident killer whales or are they risks for all of the resident killer whales? That is an outstanding question. Um, for the vessel impacts, the southern resident killer whales are probably the ones that have the most impacts because they also come into the Puget Sound where there's a lot of other vessel traffic, not just whale watch fleet. Um, contaminants are a risk factor for all marine mammals. What's interesting about the southern residents though, is they're the ones that are feeding along the coast of California and getting more DDTs because that's where all the agricultural was. And they're the ones that are in the Puget Sound where they're getting a lot more PCBs and PBDEs. Now, Northern residents are also contaminated, but they're less contaminated than Southern residents because of their distribution and the fish they're eating. And as and when you go farther into Alaska, there's less contamination. So um, yes, that's a risk factor for all killer whales. In fact, it's a huge concern for killer whales worldwide, but based on where they're living and where they're eating their fish, the risk factors are less intense for other um, populations of killer whales. That's very interesting. And then um, you had we had another question about, um, you had mentioned that there are some other groups of killer whales that eat um, marine mammals. And um, the question was whether those killer whales have, have the same levels as fish eating ones or whether they are because they're higher up on the food chain, whether they get more contaminants through bioaccumulation. Yes, that's a great question. Yes, the marine mammals that eat, or the killer whales that eat marine mammals do tend to have higher contaminant levels. So that is a risk factor for them as well. There's other issues though, like what, all the different contaminants are not equal as far as their toxicity. So we really start, need, we need to start looking into not just total levels, but what actual contaminants they're getting. So there may be differences across the groups um, for the compounds they're getting. Also, even though um, the, the transients are uh, getting high levels, um, they may not be as food limited as the transients. And I said that the blood will reflect the blubber pop level. And once you get the, the, the contaminants in the blood, that's when you start having health effects. But if an animal is not eating as well, like possibly the Southern residents, if they're you know, having issues finding the salmon, you get even more contaminants released in the circulation because they start burning through that fat in their blubber to meet their energetic demands and get the calories they need. So that could be one of the major confounding issues between a couple of our risk factors, which I didn't even talk about how they compound on each other, but there's a lot of those issues with our resident killer whales. So basically what I'm what I'm hearing from you is that is that it's not really a cut and dried situation where there's one cause. It, it, I think that this is the same way that it is in in all systems is that a lot of the times, you know, I think that as researchers, we would like to see that there's one cause, but most often it's a bunch of different things that that combine with each other, like you say, confounding factors where one element can influence another and so you have to it's our jobs job as scientists to kind of tease out those different um, um, 
elements and see right. which has more impact. Right, and I didn't mention this before, but that is one of the things that you could gain from um, using trained animals, because we know that the killer whales in SeaWorld are well-fed. We actually could tell exactly what they're eating and tested the fish. So a lot of the studies that are very difficult to uh, study out in the wild, there's a lot of confounding factors in the wild that you can't account for that you don't even know. So that's what one of the strengths of these, um, these trained animal studies are too, is because it's somewhat controlled like an experiment that you would conduct in a lab. Great. And I, I did say that it was the last question, but I have one more question from Weston, which is, um, do, the mammal meat, do the mammal eaters and the fish eaters ever breed? The genetics suggests they do not. So what's interesting is I told you that there are three pods, J, K, and L, in Southern residents, and they try their best not to interbreed within the pods because they're really closely related. But sometimes they do breed within the pods, but they really only breed within the Southern residents. And that's true for the residents that have been studied so far. Maybe in the distant past, they had a couple interbreeding, but from the recent genetics tests, um, no, there doesn't seem to be evidence that they're doing that. So that's just even within the residents. So that's different pods of residents, which is sort of similar to different families of, of people, I suppose. But so what you're saying is that they don't interbreed within those pods. Um, they don't they transfer. Try. Yeah, and they don't go across the different ecotypes either. You won't okay, see a so resident in a transient breeding. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, um, lots of new information to learn. Okay, well, thank you, Dawn. And um, I guess from here on, we'll we'll hold our questions for now, and then we'll go on to our next section with Marla. Thank you. Okay, I'm hearing a sound. Um, I'm going to mute myself. It seems to have helped. Okay, Marla, so you're on now. Hi, my name is Marla. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen if I can. Did you put me as presenter, Marla? Sorry, I just realized that I didn't make you presenter, so okay. here we go. <laughs> that was my, my bad. There you go. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. Make sure I pick the right one. It should come up. Yes, we're seeing it fine. Great. Okay, so my name is Marla Holt. I'm a research wildlife biologist at NOAA Northwest Fishery Science Center in Seattle. I work on the same team as Don Noren, um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and my path to um, studying killer whales. And so, um, so I am a West Coast gal. I grew up in San Francisco, which is shown in the um, the red star on the on the map there on the right. Um, close to uh, the foggy uh, ocean out there. So I always lived very close to the ocean and was fascinated by marine life. And one of my um, early inspirations was that I lived um, only a couple blocks from the Steinhardt Aquarium, which was part of the um, California Academy of Sciences. And so I love going to the aquarium with my mom and my sister and seeing all of the fish. And they also had two um, Pacific white-sided dolphins there. And when I was in high school, I got the opportunity to interview one of the researchers studying um, cognition in these dolphins. And so that kind of got me hooked on um, marine mammal research. And as I learned more about um, dolphins and other marine mammals, I became really interested in acoustics. So I wanted to study marine mammal acoustics. Um, and so I moved um, about an hour and a half away to Santa Cruz, California, um, to get my college degree, um, that's in the green star there. And then I also went to grad school um, to study um, pitipet acoustics in Dr. Ron Schusterman's lab. Um, and when I finished my graduate degrees and I got my PhD, I moved up to Seattle to um, study the killer whales, um, Southern resident killer whale population, particularly how they're using sound and how um, other sounds that we introduce in the environment affect them. So one of the things um, that I've done most recently is use some really cool tools to help us understand what killer, what these southern resident killer whales are doing when they are out of sight from our view. So these are um, animals that have to stay in the water their entire lives. They don't haul out on land like seals or sea lions. And so they, they're air breathers. They come to the surface to breathe. And, but that only gives us a snapshot 
of their behavior, um, much of what they have to do, including finding those big, fat, juicy Chinook that they like to eat, occurs outside of our visual um, view. And so we use these D tags. They're suction cup tags. Um, and D tag is digital acoustic recording tag. And if you have a, um, a smooth, shiny surface, these suction cups stick on um, for several hours and they can be programmed to release. And so um, one of our um, team members, Jeff Hogan, who is also the director and founder of Killer Whale Tales, um, he did a webinar earlier um, for this webinar series, um, is demonstrating this on the right, on the left hand side here. He has this um, D tag that he has a nice smooth shiny surface on his head. He stuck it on there and it would stay on there for quite a while. And so it, um, what's really cool about these tags is that they um, record information about what the whales are doing underwater when they're outside of our um, visual view. And they have accelerometers in them, which are kind of like activity trackers. So kind of like a Fitbit watch can tell you if you're walking or running or doing some of their activities. These um, D tags allow us to understand their behavior underwater. Um, and then what we can do, so first of all, how do we get it on the whale? Well, we have special permits and these are, and I get, again, these are four suction cups. So we have a very, very long pull. We approach the um, whale very, very slowly, very closely when they come up to the surface to breathe. Um, if it touches that shiny, smooth surface, it just sticks on. And then the whale wears it and it's tagged, you're it. And so the whale can swim away and it can um, do its business and go hunt fish. And we can keep track of other things around on the whale and its environment, including all the vessels. And so that's the way that we um, um, have studied um, Southern resident killer whales, um, observing them in their natural environment. And so these, these tags, um, we have to, um, we, we stay with the whale until um, the, the tag falls off because we can program it to release at a certain time. And then we get the data back. And while the whale is wearing the tag, one of the things that we do is carefully try to observe when the whale has successfully caught a fish. So Don had mentioned that sometimes there's little bits of tissue um, or scale, fish scales that are left behind. And so that's a good clue that the whale has successfully caught a fish. Um, also, um, the whale can bring up the fish to the surface. And then we can say, oh, now the whale was very successful in catching a big fat chinook. So then we can go back in the, in the DTAG record and say, what did the whale do right before it caught that fish? And what we found was that the whale dove deep, like over 600 feet. It liked to roll on its side. It did some fast jerky movements and it did lots of twists and turns. So it changed the way that its head was directed a lot during these dives. And so those are important clues that we call um, movement signatures of capturing fish. And so then we can go through all the DTAG data and say, oh, okay, this, this dive caught a fish, this dive caught a fish. And this is important because um, one of the main risk factors is prey. And so we need to know, are the animals getting enough food to support all the things that they need to do to be a healthy population? The other thing is, is that um, being uh, interested in marine mammal acoustics, I wanna know how they use sound. And so this is just a clue about, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later, but I wanted to play some sounds of the sounds that the whales are using, these Southern resident killer whales are using um, to detect and to chase and hopefully capture these big fatty Chinook. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the first um, clip of what we hear the whale the sounds that the whales are making. So hopefully you heard a bunch of click like sounds, click, 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 click and then very, very fast clicks at the end that sounded like a buzz to us. And so let me finish um, giving you my slides back. There we go. Um, and so um, at the, you might've also heard some um, noise of the water flowing over the, um, so these tags, in addition 
to the accelerometers, they also have underwater microphones, which are called hydrophones in them. And so that is a really cool thing to understand how these whales are using sound and all the other sounds in their environment um, when they're hunting these um, salmon. And so you can hear the, the, the flow noise or the water flowing over the hydrophone. And that tells us the whale is moving really fast and the um, fish is being chased. The, the fish tries to escape being eaten um, on these long dives that are fast twisty turns. And then sometimes we can hear when the whale slows down and it becomes really quiet, we hear this sound. Um, at the very end, I think you're still muted. All right. So what you what you just heard is um, some crunching sounds um, at the end of that dive before the whale comes up and ascends from that deep dive to take a breath. And so those crunching sounds tell us, oh, I caught a fish and it's crunching it up. And they, because they're big fish, they have to um, break them up. And they also like to share them with um, their matrilineal members. Because remember, they, they live in these large groups of all their family members um, that are related by the mother. So these whales are using echolocation. And echolocation, just like in bats, is where you produce a pulsed sound and it sounds like a click to our ear. Um, and when it's a really fast click, it sounds like a buzz to our ear. That means that they're getting really close to capturing that fish. Well, these whales produce these sounds and they bounce off of objects in their environment. And the thing about fish is that they have swim bladders. So swim bladders, which are shown on the lower left, are these air-filled sacs, kind of like a balloon that help the fish main float in the water at the right water um, depth. Um, so it helps in, in, in buoyancy. But the other great thing about this from an acoustics perspective is that these balloons inside these fish reflect sound really, really well. And so these animals can use sound to detect, oh, there's a big fat, um, Chinook down there, I got to go down and dive deep and catch it. And that's what they do. So these click-like sounds are used um, in southern resident killer whales to detect and capture prey. Um, other um, um, toothed whales, dolphins, and porpoises also produce echolocation, and they can use this to detect and avoid um, other animals that like to eat them. So maybe um, our mammal eating killer whales. Uh, if you're a porpoise, you want to be able to detect a mammal eating killer whale so you don't get eaten. Um, and then you also use it for navigation to avoid other obstacles in your environment because the, um, the ocean is very dark when you go down to depth. It's very dark. There's not a lot of light down there. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, sound use in marine mammals um, in the next section. And so at this point, I'm going to pause to take any questions. Okay, um, sounds good. We actually did have a question immediately from Michelle who was wondering, how do you get the information from D tags? Do you have to get the tags back in order to get the information or is it is it transmitted via satellite? Good question. You have to get the tags back. And so what we do is um, that on the tag, there is a signal that once the tag floats up to the surface, there's a little antenna on it. Um, and it's called a VHF signal, and we can hear it with a VHF receiver, and it'll beep, and we have an antenna to know where it is, and we scoop it up with a pull net, just like you scoop up the fish tissues and bits, because it floats to the surface once it's off the whale. And then we take it, we bring it back um, on land, and I, I hook it up to my computer, and I offload all the data. And so that gives us all the movement data that I described and all the audio data. So does that mean that if for whatever reason the D tag comes off in a place where you don't, where you can't find it, then you lose all that information? Yes, it would. And luckily, fingers crossed, so we're still doing some D tag work. Um, we have never lost a tag yet, knock on wood. Um, this, the study that I'm describing today, um, we only let the tags down um, until about an hour before sunset because we didn't want to lose any of the data. And now we're, we're um, looking at nighttime behavior as well. So we're, we're, we're being a little bit more risky, but because when the whales come into the Salish Sea, um, the inland waters, they're following the Chinook um, and other salmon that are going um, to the rivers to spawn, that, that they're staying in waters that are calmer, 
they're not on the on the um the outer coast um and so it's a little easier to find them yeah i would imagine that that would be one of the challenges um is to find the tags after they've dropped off just because it's a big a big ocean out there and so if you, at least if you have a smaller area in the Puget Sound you can have a better chance of finding it. Absolutely. Um, Theodore wanted to say don't lose the tags <laughs> so um, there are people who are keeping track of, of uh, what you're seeing here. Um, so Wyatt was wondering how long are southern resident killer whales um, usually underwater when they dive to hunt for food? Yeah, interesting question. So they can stay underwater for several minutes. Some of these deep dives that involve capturing um, salmon can last, you know, seven minutes or so. So when they when they dive deep and they go out of view, you know, there's really no way for us to like observe them um, from the, those depths. Um, and so and those dives can last quite a while. Okay. Um, and then Weston was wondering, do you think the sounds that orcas make are more similar to a language with syntax and grammar, or is it more like a dog barking? And I know that you're going to be talking more about vocalizations in the next section. So if you want to hold on to that, then we can use that as a teaser. But if you want to, to give a short answer, that'd be fine too. Yes. Yeah, so I, yeah, it might be good to, to wait and, and address that a little bit later, because I'm going to talk about more about their social sounds, specifically their pulsed calls. Um, um, on the next couple of slides. Okay, so then we have one more question from Juliet, um, and she says, you mentioned that the J, K, and L pods are very closely collected, connected by pod members, but what about other pods? Because I know that there are other types of pods, but what are, what are they like in terms of um, their behavior? And um, so I, this might be more of a question for Dawn, but you, could, you probably know the answer as well. Um, what, what are the interactions like between um, the J, K, and L pods, which are the southern resident um, killer whales, and other groups of killer whales? Well, you know, so what we, we started, so our Canadian colleagues, some researchers up in Canada, have done some DTAG work on northern resident killer whales as well. Um, so the first thing is, is that we know that when southern residents and northern residents are in the same kind of waters, um, they kind of just keep quiet and they pass each other and they don't interact. It's kind of like, and the same thing between the transients and the Southern residents is that they know that they're there, but they don't really interact with each other as far as um, the, the observations that we've had. So they kind of keep separate. Um, but I can say that from the DTAG work in the Northern residents, that they're using echolocation and they're hunting salmon, specifically Chinook salmon and some other salmon, just like the Southern residents, they're both resident killer whales, in fundamentally the same way, that they're using these click-like sounds to um, find and capture um, their prey in, in very similar ways. But it's very interesting that even though that they, they have very similar diets, they don't interact. That reminds me of groups in high school that don't interact. <laughs> they know they're there, but they don't talk with each other. That's like the cold shoulder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very interesting. All right, I know that we have we have about 12 minutes left, so I know you have more to talk about with um, with respect to the vocalization. So maybe we should move on. Okay. So um, as I ended the last section, I said the the ocean when you get down to deep waters, it is dark. There's not a lot of light. But guess what? Sound um, is a great way to gain information about your environment um, in the ocean. That's because sound travels much farther in water compared to air. And so sound naturally is an important source of information for a lot of marine life, including our marine mammals. In fact, all marine mammal groups use sound for social reasons, specifically for communication. And so um, a good example would be um, when babies are young and they need milk from their mothers, well, mothers and babies will call to each other or produce whistles to, to maintain contact so they don't get separated. Another reason they use sounds is to find and compete for mates. A good example is our um, male harbor seals. They um, produce these uh, um, kind of uh, bubbly growls underwater where they go, Vroom. it sounds like kind of like a motorboat a little bit. Um, and what's interesting is if you want to learn about a seal, Hoover the Talking Seal, he made bubbly sounds that almost sounded like human speech. So if you Google Hoover the Talking Seal, um, he lived at the New England Aquarium um, several decades ago, but you can find audio clips of him making bubbly sounds that sound like 
um, human speech, including his name, Uba. Um, so you can do that as a separate activity. Um, marine mammals also use um, sounds for individual and group identity. So in bottlenose dolphins, there's a lot of good work that shows that they produce signature whistles. This is um, a, a, a whistle that's unique to an individual dolphin. And so that allows them to keep track of individuals in these big, large groups when they split apart or come together. Um, with killer whales, what we know is that they live in these stable, big family groups, um, matrilineal family groups. And so the calls that they make, we call them pulse calls, actually are a family batch. And I'll talk a little bit more on, on the next slide about that. Um, they also use sound to coordinate movement when they're hunting together in a cooperative sort of way. So um, the next slide shows some spectrograms, and I'm going to play some more sounds. Um, spectrograms are basically a visual representation of sound. So the sounds that um, I study from the southern resident killer whales I've recorded on um, underwater microphones or hydrophones, um, including the D tags. And um, what you can hear are these calls that they that they like to make in each pod J of J, K, and L. They like to make, they, they share some of these sounds together, but they like to make certain call types over and over and over again. And I wanted to play these to you to, to indicate how unique some of these are. Um, and so um, the, the spectrograms here are basically showing um, um, uh, time on the horizontal axis. So that indicates how long the sound lasts. Um, frequency on the vertical axis is pitch, so your low pitch on the on the um, the lower end, and the high pitch is the higher frequency part of it. Um, and then the color shows how intense or loud certain components of that sound is. And so these are visual representations. I think you're going to look at some spectrograms later on this week. So I thought I'd explain that a little bit better. And I'm going to play some sounds from um, JPod, and each of these sounds have been cataloged by some work um, thanks to John Ford in the early um, late 70s and early 80s. And, and so he studied this in both Southern residents and Northern residents, and we find that they produce different calls, repertoires, or different groups of sounds. Um, so Northern residents don't produce the same um, groups of calls that Southern residents do. So I'm gonna play these sounds. Uh, the first one is going to be the J-Pod call S1. So S stands for Southern Resident. Oh, gotta load it up. Don't forget to unmute yourself, Marla. Thank you. That was the S1 call. j -Pod likes to make that S1 call. Work. That's the S44 call on the lower left, that's another J-Pod call. That's K-Pod call, an S-16 call. And another S-17 call by K-Pod. They sound like mewing cats underwater. So I, when I hear that, that's an L-Pod call. It sounds like a, a dog playing with a squeaky ball. And then the S-19 call is that call that they make that's like this upsweep call. So hopefully you got a sense of the different kinds of calls that they make. And in particular, what I wanted to point out is that, you know, J-Pod has a sound like a squeaky, it's kind of a, a, a um, maybe a window, you know, squeak on the, on the um, when you're cleaning a window. K-Pod sounds like mewing cats. Um, so I think, you know, K, K for kitty cat, if I hear the mewing sounds, and then the L-Pod calls, I think sound more like, um, either dogs playing with squeaky balls or like birds or something like that. And so that's how I, I kind of keep track of the different calls. And so we can use the fact that they um, have these different call types. And um, when um, when they go to the outer coast, as Donna mentioned, there's this, there's the satellite tags, which are the different, different types of tags and the suction cup tags. Um, well, another cool tool that we use is underwater acoustic recorders and they're called soundtrack. And we can put them out for a whole year on different parts of the outer coast from the very northern tip of Washington all the way down to um, um, where I grew up, San Francisco. Um, and we can document the different killer whale calls that are recorded on these instruments. And then when we hear the sounds of killer whales, we can tell, oh, is that a Southern resident? Is it a Northern resident? Maybe it's a transient or bigs killer whale. 
Um, and even when it's a Southern resident call, we can say, oh, that is LPOD or that is KPOD, depending on the calls that we hear. And so I wanted to test your knowledge a little bit by sharing um, a clip of one um, pod. And you can tell me, maybe in the chat or guess, um, say, okay, well, what, what calls do you think this is? Hold on a second. Getting There we go. Load that up and I'm gonna play this. So these are calls reported by the DTACs, but we would also hear them on our sound traps. So we've got a couple of guesses coming in. Juliet thinks it's K-Pod. Theodore thinks it's K-Pod. And yeah, it does sound very much like kittens mewing. So we've got, oh, Harper also thinks that it's K and so does Michael. So a lot of people are, are, are queuing into your, your um, relationship between the, the mewing sound and um, K. So yes, everybody so far, um, Finn, JC, Wyatt, uh, Michael, they're all saying K-Pod. Great, you guys did a great job of paying attention. So yes, those were K-Pod animals. And if we recorded them you know, off of a sound trip on the Columbia, then we can say, oh, K-Pod was off the Columbia in the spring, they must be following the um, salmon runs there. And so that's another way that we can document presence and um, the way that they use different parts of their habitat during different seasons um, to understand what what um, what habitats are important to protect. And so when we can't get out there in the winter because of the big storms um, on, the, in the, on the coast of the Pacific Northwest, this is another way that we can um, study um, their presence and um, how they're using their habitat. Okay, so they, they rely on sound um, incredibly for so many reasons and, and for all the things that they have to do, including finding fish and keeping with each other because they have to, you know, stay in their, in their um, matrilineal groups. Um, and so um, what, what I look at is not only how they use sound, but how other sounds can interfere with that important use of sound. Um, there's natural sources of sound, of course, in the ocean that they've evolved um, to coexist with, and these can be non-living sources like wind and waves and other weather-related events, um, living sounds like, um, you know, baleen whales calling, humpback whales calling, um, seals producing the, the bubbly growls um, during their mating season, et cetera. But then the human sources that are increasingly, the, the, those are the sounds that we increasingly put into the ocean, um, including those from vessel traffic, all the, the good, goods that we ship across the ocean, um, all the boats that are out on the water um, are increase the background levels of sounds that can interfere with um, how killer whales are using sound. And then there's also sounds that we intentionally introduce like sonar. Um, and so using the D tags allow us to document these human produced sounds while the whales are foraging. So we're really looking at the interaction between the prey risk factor and the disturbance risk factor in our D tag study. And I wanted to, just, this is the final um, sound clip that I'll play for you to illustrate what some vessel sounds are when the, the, when the killer whales are wearing the tags. Um, so you get a sense of what that sounds. So maybe not a very interesting sound, but it's loud and it is, it, it, it is broad across a range of frequencies. And so a lot of times when a vessel gets really close to the whale, we hear that increase in background sound. And as Don mentioned before, we've documented that the whales have to raise their voices to be heard above this background um, sound from these vessels, for example. Okay, so when we put the information together about how the whales are using sound to hunt their, their um, preferred prey, their Chinook. Um, and then we also document the boats that are around them during the same time when they're wearing the tag. Um, what we find is when there's more boats, there's more noise. When the boats go faster, there's also more noise, just like in a car, when you're going faster, your car is gonna make more sounds or higher noise than when the car is going slower. Um, what we also found is that when the vessels get close to the killer whales, that they capture less fish. And so that's an important 
um, thing to document to show that vessel disturbance does affect their ability to um, eat fish when they're in the Salish Sea. And then in particular, females tend to switch to non-hunting behaviors. And so that's also a concern um, ab about um, disturbance um, from vessels. And so we've talked a lot about risk factors. This is just a, a little bit of examples of what you can do to help Southern residents as an endangered population. Um, and the, the, they're related to all of the, the main risk factors of the population. Um, one, thing you could do is um, view killer whales from land so that you don't introduce noise from motorized boats in, into their um, environment. And so you can Marlon, go to land from- I think, I think your, yeah. um, your, your slides are not showing right now. Oh, okay. My bad, let me, right. I'm trying to share, but all I'm seeing is the main slide. Somehow I got, Oh. oh, interesting. That's, um, well, I'll just talk about it if we don't get the other slides up, because okay. this is the last slide. So I was going to say you can view killer whales on land. Um, if you do go out in the water to, um, to view killer whales, then follow the vessel rules and view whale-wise. That is, keep your distance and slow your vessel down. Also, not all vessels are created equal in the amount of noise that they introduce in the environment. Some vessels are quieter than others, including the bigger ships. Um, um, support salmon recovery. As we heard, these killer whales like salmon. So anything that supports salmon recovery will help the whales. We want to reduce our water waste because salmon like fresh water. Uh, and then reduce chemical pollutants um, introduced in our waterway. Um, and even things like planting a rain garden can help that. And so I feel those are um, just some examples you can do to help Southern resident killer whales, and there's going to be opportunities to, to um, um, talk about more of these type of activities on Friday um, during your camp. And with that, I will take questions. Okay, um, we are just about at time, so I think that maybe we can have one question. Um, actually, uh, Harper had asked, are there other types of pods besides J, K, and L. And I think that you had mentioned that, that, the, that about the Northern resident killer whales and, um, but are they divided into pods as well? Yes, they are divided in pods. Um, a pod, B pod, there's, you know, um, there's, there's, so there's different acoustic clans within the Northern residents. So J pod, so when they share different call, groups of calls and they have what's called an acoustic clan, um, and so Southern residents are part of just one clan, but Northern residents have different clans and they have like G clan, for example, includes some whales and um, G pod. And, and then there's even, there's even an iPod before iPods were even created. Um, that's a interesting little tidbit. Great, well, uh, we are at time. So um, I wanted to thank both you and Don for sharing the information that you have on Southern Re resident killer whales. I think that we, we, we touched on a bunch of really, really interesting ways to study killer whales um, and interesting um, instruments that we use. So um, I really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to come and talk with us. And thank you to all of our viewers um, for coming into our NOAA Science Camp webinars. We do have another webinar tomorrow talking about um, our marine mammal labs here at the Alaska Fishery Science Center and how we use um, how we study marine mammal food habits. And then we have another webinar on Thursday talking about vocalizations of whales in the Olympic Coast Marine, National Marine Sanctuary. So thank you to both of you for taking the time to share your knowledge with us. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about our research. Thank you. All right. Thanks, and uh, we'll see you next time.